I'm Katie. I'm Brooke. I'm Jen. I'm Chris. <laughs> and welcome, welcome to Grace. Grace. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marion. Welcome to Grace. Hey, Grace family. I'm out here enjoying the nice sun, and I'm enjoying Golgotha Hill because it is almost Good Friday. I hope you are all doing well. Welcome to Grace. Hi, I'm Zach. Welcome to Grace's online worship service. Good morning and welcome to Grace United Methodist Church on this Palm Sunday morning. As we start to walk into Holy Week and we leave behind the season of Lent, we want to invite you to join us right here online at noon on Friday for our Good Friday service. And then Sunday morning, we'll air our service at sunrise for Easter Sunday. We are so glad that you're here, and it's wonderful to be able to reach out to you, but we want to hear back. Normally at this time in our service, we'd be passing a red roster and having you fill it out. But since we can't, we're going to ask you right below to click like or leave a comment and let us know how everyone's doing. We miss you guys, and we cannot wait until we're all back together again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Mercifully assist us, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life everlasting. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. There are very specific events that the church remembers on this day. They are found in Matthew 21 as Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time. Let's hear Matthew's accounting of what's happened. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Respond with me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We praise and thank you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was acclaimed son of David and king of kings by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path. We ask that you bless these branches and those who bear them and grant that we may ever hail him as our Lord and King and follow him with perfect confidence through the same Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 14 through 25. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain one and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he sat at a table with the twelve disciples, and as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Is it I, Master? He said to him, You have said so. Now join us in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hope everybody's doing great out there. Uh, I woke up this morning and I was missing everyone and I was missing going to church and I was missing being part of uh, the Sunday school classes and being part of the, the sanctuary activities and, and really just the welcome center and the snacks and, and all of it. And so when I went to do my Bible study, I decided to go looking for something in the Bible to comfort me. And what I came upon was 2 Corinthians in chapter 1. Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. This isn't for nothing. This time we have with our family, this time we have away from the normal day to day, we can take comfort that God is doing something with that and we can take the comfort that we get from God and give it to those people around us that need it so bad right now. So I'm going to try the best that I can to show the people around me comfort, even though I might be a little sad, and even though I might be a little confused and not know exactly what to do. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to trust that the comfort that he gives me is comfort that I can give to the people that I love until we get through this tough time. I miss everybody and I can't wait to see you again. Send us videos and send us messages and say hi to us so that we know that you're out there giving each other comfort and hanging in there the best you can and remembering that God's got this. Can we say a quick prayer to remember that we're all out here separate but we're together in God's love and that can comfort us until we get together in person. Lord, thank you for this time to remember what Paul said about your love and your comfort that you give to us so that we can give it to the people around us in times of need. Let us carry that in our hearts until we can meet again together in fellowship and join hands and be the church community that we miss so much. Thank you for all your blessings and for all your comfort. In your name we pray. Amen. It is so wonderful to be a part of the Grace family. 
I get to watch on a day-to-day -day basis as you serve, you give your energy and your resources to this church every day to make our ministries happen, to see how you serve this community and how you serve each other. On an ordinary day, this church is extraordinary, but it's times like these that I'm overwhelmed by your kindness, your generosity, and your willingness to help. I think back to when we went through Florence together, how everyone just came and joined with our community to serve and give. And right now, even though we're isolated and apart, I see you doing the very same thing. You're calling people on the phone, you're sending letters, you're sending emails, you're connecting on this weird Zoom online chat thing that we're doing. You are trying every way possible to still be part of the ministries, and we are so thankful for that. I'm also thankful for the staff that works here. They are learning this new technology so quickly. We're trying to find ways to connect with you that are not normal for us, but we're willing to learn because you mean that much. In the next few moments, we're gonna have some of the information on what we're gonna be doing, some announcements for you, and some ways for you to give in this time apart. Your giving now more than ever matters. I know we're gonna come back as a community, but that community is gonna have needs, gonna have things that we need to reach out and help with. And the money that you give right now is gonna help us keep this church serving our community the way we always do. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for taking time to join us this morning. And thank you for all that you do. We have acknowledged God's presence. We've praised him in song. Now let's speak to him and hear him speak to us. Dear God, as we enter your presence, as we focus on your presence, not just with us, but inside of us through your Holy Spirit, we are aware of your holiness and we are aware of our unworthiness. And so first we release every care, concern, offense, and disappointment to you. Jesus, you are familiar with offense and disappointment. Out of love, you came to earth in human flesh to show us the way, but you were rejected and deeply hurt. We know that sometimes we hurt you. When we hurt each other, we are hurting you. When we think we have a better way than your way, we are deeply hurting you. Show us what our faults are. You have said that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
and you will give us your peace, peace that passes understanding. We want your peace. and We need your forgiveness. Please forgive us, cleanse us, renew us, and please give us your peace. Please make your way clear so that our lives will be a blessing to you and to others. Sometimes, Lord, we're walking, but we can't see the way ahead. Sometimes it's hard to face what is in front of us. But we know that you're here with us and that you're guiding us because you promised that you would never leave us or forsake us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit living in us, correcting us, guiding us, comforting us. Thank you for sending help as we fight against the unseen enemy of coronavirus. Please protect all those on the front lines who are sacrificing their lives to make others well. Protect their families. Please guide the thinking process of researchers and medical personnel who are trying so hard to find medicines and vaccines that will destroy this terrible virus. Lord, please fill their minds with ideas and concepts that they need to know. And please, dear Lord, as so many of us across the world are living different lives, please let this season be one that makes our faith in you stronger, not weaker. Help us to see good in every day, even the hard ones. Into your wisdom we place our lives, trusting in your love. And now we join our hearts together in praying to you the prayer Jesus taught, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today being Palm Sunday marks the beginning of our observance of Holy Week as followers of Jesus. One of the central pieces of the story of Holy Week is Judas' betrayal of Jesus, which begs for me the question, why did Ju Judas turn Jesus in? Why would he do that? That's what we're going to swim around in in the next couple of minutes. In order to get us there, let me ask you this. Have there ever been things in your life that seemed like a good idea at the time, but yet wound up being not such a good idea down the road? Guys, I got two ideas for you. Two words for you to consider in that light. Leisure suits. Remember those 70s kind of things? Do any of you have them still hanging in your closet? You don't have to email in and admit that. Or how about this that may sound like a good idea at the time, but later, I don't know. You ever bought that thing and then later on, maybe even before you got that thing home, had buyer's remorse? You thought this thing that you were spending money on was going to be really good. Something you needed was going to somehow change your life, and then it didn't. There are things that we all do that now and again sound, seem like a good idea at the time, but down the road shortly uh, didn't turn out to be such a good idea after all, did they? I really think that some of that describes what was happening in Judas, the mindset that was his. We're going to try to get inside the head of Judas a little bit to see why he would have done what he did, why he would have turned Jesus in. I think part of it was exactly what we were just describing. It seemed to Judas like a good idea at the time to betray Jesus to the authorities. In order to get at why G Judas may have been thinking this, it would be helpful for us to examine what the expectation was of the Messiah in Jesus and Judas' day. What did the Jewish folks expect their Messiah when he showed up to do? They expected the Messiah would come and set up an earthly kingdom. If you remember, at this time, the 
area of Israel was occupied by the Roman force, had been for decades, and the folks had well had enough of it. So they were convinced that when the Messiah showed up, he would come as this military leader, galvanize the forces of Israel, and against all odds would defeat the enemies of Israel, run them out of the land, and they would be free of this frustrating occupation by the Romans. So the expectation was that the Messiah would come and set up this earthly kingdom. We see some of this unfolding when the crowds were said, we're looking for Jesus. You can read about that in John's Gospel, chapter 11. All of the crowds were looking for Jesus. He's going to show up at this Passover gathering during this week there in, in Jerusalem. What a great platform this would have been, they would have been thinking, for the Messiah to come and launch this glorious march towards overthrowing the enemies of Israel, specifically the Romans. So all of Jerusalem is asking, is Jesus going to show up? Remember how when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem for the last time. The crowds were there shouting, Hosanna in the highest. And they were waving palm branches and, and lining the road with, with their outer garments and, and with palm branches for the donkey he was riding to walk in because they thought it's going to happen now. Surely the Messiah, Jesus, is going to kick in gear this overthrow of all the enemies of Israel, and the Messiah is going to do what we expected him to do. That's how the week began. That's what the event that we remember on this Palm Sunday. But we also remember how things moved forward from there. How that there was another crowd towards the end of the week that was shouting, release Barabbas, not Jesus. Release for us Barabbas. In fact, when it comes to Jesus, crucify him. Here's what I think. That some of the same crowd that at the beginning of the week, loaded with expectation, was shouting towards Jesus, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the Lord. Do it now, Jesus. I really believe that some of those same people were in the crowd towards the end of the week with raised fists instead of palm branches shouting, crucify him. He didn't fulfill their expectation. The Messiah was supposed to set up this earthly kingdom that would be to their benefit. They would be the center of the world and it would just work gloriously well for them. Jesus didn't do that. So they shouted, crucify him. And behind this was that same expectation that the Messiah would set up this earthly kingdom. I really believe that Judas was called up in this same expectation. So at some point during this Holy Week, Jesus doesn't make his move and Judas is looking. Judas is, along with the other Jews, are expecting Jesus to do what he surely thought the Messiah would do. He's watching, he's waiting, and Jesus is making no move. There's still no maneuvering to set up an earthly kingdom. And Judas is getting frustrated. He's getting anxious. And so he finds himself in front of the Jewish leaders Asking the question that we hear in today's scripture reading, what will you give me if I betray him to you? Hmm. How often have we painted G Judas in the life of the church as this really bad guy that he did what he did because he was against Jesus? I really don't think he was. I think he was very much for Jesus but he thought that if he could turn Jesus in, back Jesus in a corner, then it would force Jesus' hand. It would make him make a move. Go ahead, Jesus. Set up this earthly kingdom. I believe it was in the 1950s when this gentleman from Virginia, Ernest Amurian, wrote a play called The Last Supper. He wrote the play trying to capture da Vinci's iconic painting of the Last Supper, da Vinci in his painting tried to capture what he perceived the moment might have looked like when Jesus said to his disciples, one of you will betray me. And he captures the shock all across the table with the disciples sitting there. 
Well, Ernest and Miriam tries to capture that in this play. And in the course of this play, he has each of the disciples one by one step forward and offer a soliloquy as to who they were and what they might have been thinking as they hear Jesus speak these words, one of you will betray me. The central character in this play is Judas. Part of what Judas has to say is this, and I think Ernest and Miriam captures well what Judas' thinking probably was that led him to turn Jesus in. Listen to this. Here's what Judas says in this play. If I conspired with the chief priest, and if I received 30 pieces of silver, that's my affair. I believe in Jesus, but someone has to force the issue, make him assert himself as God's Messiah. He refuses to make a move. Well, I've made one. He hints he knows what I've done. He said so when he washed my feet a few moments ago, and when he dipped our bread in the same dish as me. But I have my reasons. My soul isn't as black as some of you think, nor is your soul as white. What would you do if you were in my place and wanted Jesus to do something, something dramatic and startling to usher in his kingdom? What would you do? Here's what I invite you to hear in the words that Judas offers in this play. So Judas wasn't against Jesus at all. He was for Jesus. He believed in Jesus. He was just misguided. Judas mistook what he wanted to see happen for the will of God. The voice in his head that told Judas, this is a really good thing to turn Jesus in, to force his hand. This is a really good thing. Judas mistook his own thoughts for the very voice of God. So it doesn't take long going forward before Judas has significant buyer's remorse. He eventually, according to some of the accounts, takes his own life. Here's the challenge that this brings to us. How easy is it for you and for me to mistake the voice in my head that I think sounds like a really good idea, a really good thing, like Judas, I can mistake that for the voice of God. So I can take off in directions in my life that don't honor God while the whole time I feel like I am, I think that I am. What we might want to consider in this Palm Sunday is some th gifts that we have, gifts from God that can help us distinguish our voice, what we want to see happen, from the voice of God. Sometimes in the midst of our wanting to honor God, I can pause to reflect and, reflect and do what the New Testament tells me to do to, to test the Spirit. Because everything that speaks to me, everything that enters my heart, everything that enters my mind isn't coming from the Spirit of God. Sometimes it can come from me. And I don't know about you, but I can be quite misguided at times. We have some gifts that we can exercise to help us separate our own voice from the voice of God to keep us on track and, and, and honor God. If I'm just left to my own, I can get far afield very easily without even knowing that I'm doing it. Well, let's consider these gifts. There are four things that John Wesley helped to put together and it, this ideas around these things and this way of thinking about these things that are right in front of us. John Wesley helped put the idea of this and the concept of this together for us. It's come to be called in the years since John Wesley, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And what these four things can do to help, can help rescue us from our own voice. And help us quiet that to hear the voice of God. These four things that make up the Wesleyan quadrilateral are these. The first is scripture. Scripture, of course, is primary. It's our highest rule and guide of faith 
and living as we endeavor to honor Jesus Christ. We need to read it. We need to devour it. We need to feast on that as part of our spiritual discipline. We need to read it, but it helps us to be able to read it in context. We need to help reading it so that we can understand these writers from two and 3,000 years ago, why what they wrote made sense to them then. What was the situation to which they were writing? You know, these writers were people of their day. And they were influenced by the thinking of their day. And their thinking then is not the same in many regards as our thinking is now. So what was their thinking back then? And to read it through those lens helps us tremendously. So scripture would be primary. But we have three other lens that help us read the scripture well. The next of those lens, the second part of the quadrilateral, would be tradition. What has the church traditionally taught? I know there are some parts of the church that say we're just supposed to ignore what folks in the past in the church have taught and, and thought and, and how they perceive God because we know better now. Well, folks have been pretty interested and attuned to the life and heart of God for a long time, and there's value us in mining what they have to offer to us. So tradition, what has the church always taught around what I'm considering and what I think I'm hearing from the voice of God. That can be one of the lens that we use to help us read scripture. Another of the lens is this, the third part of the quadrilateral would be reason. Simply what makes sense. I know what I want and I know that what I want can make what I want make sense to me in the moment. But does what I want, what I'm drawn towards as I filter it through my reasoning, which is a great gift of God, as I filter it through my reasoning, does it fit with the overall message of who Scripture reflects God as being? Another of the lens, the fourth part of the Wesleyan quadrilateral would be experience. Does what I'm thinking considering what I'm perceiving to be uh, right and God-honoring, does it fit with what I have experienced in the presence of God? Does it fit with my experience of who God is? One of the beginning places for all of us as we honor God would be to know that God is loving, God is gracious. He did not withhold even his only son, but gave him as a sacrifice for our sin. We see that unfolding as we journey into and through this holy week that begins now. We see how amazing the grace of God truly is, how wide the love of God truly is. It's what I'm thinking and feeling and considering as to be the will of God for me, is it keeping with that, with the experience of the God who found me and who saved me? It's so easy for me, so easy for all of us, really, to get off track as we're trying to serve God. It takes discipline for us to stay on track, to leave Lives that are God honoring. And these give some strength, these Wesleyan quadrilateral scripture, tradition, reason, experience, they can help to keep us in line, help as guides along the way as we endeavor to live lives that honor God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh.